Funding for Colores was provided in part by the Nalita E. Walker Fund, KNME TV Endowment Fund, the Great Southwestern Arts and Education Endowment Fund, and viewers like you. My heart belongs to nature. This time on Colores. A photographic tribute, author John Nichols' beautiful new book from UNM Press, My Heart Belongs to Nature, was created from a lifetime of observing, experiencing, and loving nature. From the moment I was born, I was surrounded by people who loved the natural world and explained it to me. I mean, I was absorbed that that was my first great love. Sheep on a rich top and single file. It's all ahead on Colores. Hi, I'm John Nichols. Hi, I'm Lucy Nichols. And our hearts belong to nature. I see three lesser goldfinches and uh, two pine siskins. They're really pretty. They are pretty. I'm amazed that the goldfinches have been here all winter. You, you remember when you, you would make these? Yeah. Can you read that? Find plants and tape them to a piece of paper like this. Yeah. <laughs> I learned a little bit about the leaves because uh, Papa or my grandpa helped me discover new plants and new things that I didn't know what were called or didn't know were here before. Those little siskins are really eating their seeds. Yeah. They must be hungry. Yeah, after long winter they must after be After really long winter, I know. Hungry. Sometimes I think about how like how many different things there are in the world, and how many things we haven't discovered compared to how many things we have discovered. I mean, it's important to know and care, right? The curious thing about this book, My Heart Belongs to Nature, is I just thought, you know, maybe just a gentle book with photographs of, of, of how much I've cared for a particular area it seems to me that photography, like all the other arts and stuff like that, theater that discusses human dilemmas or social justice or whatever, they're all a part of trying to create um, the positive world for us to live in. My heart belongs to nature and I know it always will. I love the sound of thunderstorms and the calls of whippoorwills. Ravens, aerial acrobatics always make me smile. And it's fun to see the bighorn sheep on a rich top in single file. When I was just a little boy, my grandpa and my dad took me out for long, long walks through the forest and meadowlands. We saw eagles circling up high and herons in the lake. And sometimes we'd see marsh wrens chattering way down in the breaks. My grandpa was a really fine ichthyologist. For 40 years at our best museum, he was king of their fish. When he was young, my daddy wished to be a field zoologist. I used to follow after him through meadows in the mist. 
from the moment I was born, I was surrounded by people who loved the natural world and explained it to me. I mean, I was absorbed. That, that was my first great love. My grandfather worked at the American Museum of Natural History. I would ride with him on the Long Island Railroad train into the museum, right? I'd visit his office. His office was just bottles of pickled fishes and pickled frogs and snakes and whatever. He, he was an ichthyologist, herpetologist. And my grandfather and my father kept records of almost everything in the natural world. Uh, my dad and my grandfather kept a daily record of all the birds they saw, which is pretty incredible when you think of how many years they did it. My dad sent my grandfather letters all his life from the age of six or seven until my grandfather died um, in 1958. My father would draw the birds and say, you know, what's this? Or is this a particular type of semi-palmated plover that I haven't seen before, <laughs> you know? And grandpa would answer him. I mean, their, their relationship was predicated on um, going back and forth and constantly interconnecting about the, the natural world and particularly uh, ornithology, particularly the birds. A naturalist is a person who has a macroscopic overview of how the entire planet works. A naturalist is somebody like John Muir who understands that, quote, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. This is the camera I really love, the Nikon Epi, but it's heavy. Before that, I had a Nikromat. It was even heavier. But then the Olympus is just, you know, <laughs> it's, this I used for a lot of, you know, a lot of um, panoramas, just blip, 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 like that. Between the ages of 56 and 70, I spent sometimes two or three days a week in the high country mountains, hiking up to 13,000 feet. Every hike I took, I took photographs. I have all the packets from that, and I kept field notes from five to ten pages of typed notes. And every trip that I made, I also tried to put together panoramas. Basically, it's really simple. This is a panorama of the little tarn that is featured in My Heart Belongs to Nature in a number of photographs. You just try and line everything up as closely as you can. And it's as simple as playing three card Monty in New York City on a sidewalk on a cardboard box. And when you see the cops coming, you can immediately run away. Presto. Photo is worth a thousand words. <laughs> Better to show you a picture of a fish than try and explain it, you know. My father took photographs of birds because he, he was very interested in, in defining their habits, their posturing, you know, that kind of thing, just the whole language of what made them work. I've taken photographs. I'm not at all a scientist. I'm not at all like my father, you know. But I just took photographs because, I mean, it was another way of communicating with that world. Once I had a two-room apartment on Gaiora Street in Taos. The year was 1990. I was 50 years old. Outside, there was a very small lawn, and a single tulip grew in the grass. One morning at dawn, just before I went to bed, I took a picture of the tulip. Everybody that people look at and they think is mundane on the planet, whether it's a weed in my garden 
or, or an elm tree that's, whose roots are destroying my septic system, right? Or a stock tank out on the Western Mesa is incredibly interesting. In the beginning, it's the place. The place is flat. It's full of sagebrush. There's hardly any trees, maybe no trees. So the sky is exposed 360 degrees. You know, you can look everywhere. And I love just being in that space. It's empty, used to be empty. It's not empty anymore. Face Rejas used to be my favorite mountain when it stood all alone in the middle of the Western Mesa surrounded by nobody. You can barely see the nub of a third ear to the left of the second ear in this picture. Before people came, eagles nested up under the middle ear. Those are Jack Bradley's horses grazing to the west. For years, Bradley had his camp and animals on the northwest tip of the Carson Reservoir behind Tres Orejas. But Bradley, too, left when the onslaught arrived. After my BW buses died, I bought a 1980 Dodge D-150 pickup truck secondhand. It lasted for 30 years. I collected many cords of wood, chugged up into the mountains, out to the mesas, and everywhere else. The truck fetched sheep manure from my gardens from Pacomio Mondragon and Llano Quemado. I drove Andres Martinez all over Taos County while he explained where the old flour mills used to be, where horse thief Shorty had lived, and where the Acequia de los Americanos once ran south of Los Cordovas. Mike Kimmel and I drove that truck up Little Rivers, and for many Septembers, Andy Lenderman and I took it grouse hunting in Unit 49. I used hay bales and big rocks for weight, especially during the winter. If you live in town, but you love the wild, you need a truck. It's a contradiction, yet I assuaged my conscience by loving the land and animals that those wheels conveyed me to. Being on, on the Mesa, you walk around, and it's like there's nothing for miles. And you're out there just in empty space. And I love that. And then by accident, one day I was walking across, walking through a stock pond and saw all these little clamshells on the bottom of the stock pond. And I said, why are there clamshells in this little stock tank? So I went to the library, I got a book, I started reading about arthropods, I learned about clam, clam shrimp and fairy shrimp. And all of a sudden I said, wow, I bet this will be interesting when it gets water. And so I went back, and I went back, and I went back, and then one day it rained. My real claim to fame is that I'm the world's foremost authority on photographing southwestern stock ponds. For years, as I walked around the empty western mesa, I observed the life cycles of just a few stock ponds over there, and I also took many pictures. Days on end, I would set up my tripod and camera and just wait. I'd wait for the twilights to change color. I'd wait for the cloud formations to shift, reflecting the sun. I'd wait for rain wisps to appear from the north or from the south. I'd wait for ducks to land in the water or for phalaropes and ibises to arrive. I waited and watched as bats and nighthawks hunted just-born insects above the puddles. I was mesmerized by the quietude, the lack of noise, the silence occasionally broken by coyote cries. I thought nothing was more beautiful than those diminutive puddles of water among the treeless sagebrush plain with the wide sky above. A stock pond, people say, 
There's nothing interesting about that except a few cows and sheep come and drink there, right? But if you're quiet, everything will come, right? And I would sit right on the edge of a stock pond. And I remember once there was a sanderling walking around in the mud, picking out little microscopic bits. And it came right up to my shoe and picked something out of the treads of my sneaker. You know, you don't move, just don't move. There's spadefoot toads galore in the stock ponds. There's wajalotes, there's mosquitoes. I would sit on the bank and it looks like rain is falling on the water, but it's mosquitoes being born. And immediately they get eaten by the swallows and the nighthawks that are flying over the pond, eating them. No, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, there's just so much life that nobody pays attention to. And then I became fascinated by the, the three little rivers, the Rio Chiquito Pot Creek and the Little Rio Grande that run out of the southeast in Taos County. And I just fished them and hiked them and traveled all over and, 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 and then went grouse hunting up there for years and years and years. And then I became obsessed with the high mountains from the age of about 58 until 70. I mean, I would climb up to 13,000 feet two or three times a week. These are my old snowshoes. They actually have fairly complicated straps. And you can see that they're put together with duct tape. One winter, I think I made 60 snowshoe trips. I got really psyched out with snowshoeing. You know, you, you go climbing up into a universe that's just boulders and talus and scree, and everybody says, why are you doing that? And the fact of the matter is, is there's as much life in just boulders and rocks and scree as there is in a lush meadow. You know, there's a million naked souls in the city and every one of them has a story. And there's a billion naked souls in the natural world and every one of them has a story. When I started climbing in the high mountains, I said, oh my God, bighorn sheep, that's pretty exotic and wonderful. And the first thing I did is read like three books by Valerius Geist, who is one of the great, you know, bighorn naturalists, one of the early ones. And I just said, okay, I'm gonna learn everything I can about this animal. And then I said, I'm gonna learn everything I can about the botany of the area that I'm traveling through. And then I'm gonna learn everything I can about the mig migratory birds, when they come, when they go, you know, when are the hermit thrushes here, when do they nest, when do they leave, that kind of stuff. You know, people often say, well, are you religious or something like that? And I say, no, but, but in terms of organized human religions, but it seems to me that life, just everything that's alive is incredibly amazing. And that's, you know, that's enough belief for me. I can't believe I carried these out in the mountains from 12,000 feet. You know, you look at these boulder fields and they just look like boulders and rocks and talus. And then you just start looking at what you're walking on and everything is so different. I mean, it's like being in Monet's garden with 200 million different flowers and lily pads and weeping willows and only it's rocks. You know, when my, when my dad was courting my mother, they were walking along the beach and he picked up a moonstone and gave it to her, and she kept it in her jewelry box for the rest of her life. I keep these in my jewelry box for the rest of my life. The land is filled with talismans. Some people like to walk up and down Fifth Avenue, walk into Tiffany's and buy jewels, right? But if you look at things, there's nothing that's not really complicated and really interesting and really beautiful. 
and, and these things move me deeply. When the winter comes, I love to snowshoe through the tall spruce trees. Animal tracks in the snow really put my heart at ease. Snowshoe hares and pine martens and sometimes ermine too. I trail them across the snow as they search for voles and shrews. From this angle, you can see that Gimpwig carried his right wing with its tip close to the ground. He seemed able to fly okay, but I never saw him hanging around with other nutcrackers. And I sensed it was because of his disability that he gravitated toward my offer of easy tidbits. My guidebook tells me that nutcrackers are fairly aggressive in seeking handouts, yet I've never noticed that except for Gimpwing, and I would not have called him aggressive. But I think connecting to a wild creature is about as exciting and as revealing as life can get for a human being. My heart belongs to nature and I know it always will. I love the sound of thunderstorms and the calls of whippoorwills. Ravens, aerial acrobatics always make me smile. And it's fun to see the bighorn sheep on a ridge in single file. Ravens, aerial acrobatics, they always make me smile. And it's fun to see the bighorn sheep on a ridge top in single file. Do you remember back in the autumn when the, the bright goldfinches were here? Mm-hmm, yeah. I would love Lucinda to grow up really involved with the natural world. I would love her and everybody else on the planet, frankly, to grow up with a real appreciation for the natural world, a care for the natural world, so that they actually chose a life that didn't destroy the natural world, that they were very self-conscious about, you know, leaving the small footstep, about trying to lead a sustainable life, that kind of thing. Lucinda's generation, if they don't know that, they're dead in the water. You know, our generation and the generation before and the generations that comprise the Industrial Revolution have pretty much put the planet, the natural planet, on the edge of the abyss. The only way that we find a real love for nature is when we're young and if our family is into it and if our family encourages it. If you don't know about or understand climate change and want to be a part of changing your life and the life of the human species so that we go in a different direction, then, then, then we're screwed. So I think evermore, you know, a love of the so-called natural world is, is um, really important to survival. To catch the sunset clouds over Wheeler Peak from this perspective, you had to be camping at the Little Tarn a mile west of Wheeler Peak across the Alpine Bowl on August 17, 2002. Altitude, 12,000 feet. For me as I write, that was 14 years ago, yet it seems like only yesterday. They say time flies when you're having fun. Yet when I contemplate this picture and all the others in this book, time stands still, memories flood over me, 
And I thank nature profoundly for its gifts of awareness, connection, and deliverance. If they could tell their story, what would it be? Next week on Colores, distinguished author, playwright, and activist, New Mexican Denise Chavez shares her inspiration. The shallow air of this one. If you're attuned to the writing of the world and the story of the world, you don't have to go anywhere. All you have to do is go get a hamburger at Blake's and the story's right there. This little moment of joy. With a passion for culture and tradition, renowned New Mexican musician Roberto Mondragon emphasizes the importance of stories and song. I don't think you would have much of a culture if you didn't have music and if you didn't have songs that are composed of music and poetry coming together to tell a story. Author of Rounders and High Low Country, Max Evans shares how the West and New Mexico inspired his writing. What you're doing, you're extracting the essence of life into the essence of a story. Until next time, thank you for watching. Funding for Colores was provided in part by the Nalita E. Walker Fund, KNME TV Endowment Fund, the Great Southwestern Arts and Education Endowment Fund and viewers like you.